Why do you think we need this kind of law? We have a strong transatlantic friendship, which have gone through a lot of different periods. And we will continue this friendship. Uh, this friendship is not threatened. We also have the strategic interest of having a good relationship with Russia, good relations with Russia, even in the most difficult times. I've always said that Russian NATO Council continues to operate, that the European Union always continues in contacts with Russia. It's important to continue the dialogue. Our civil societies need to stay in touch in the Russia-Germany relations on different levels, can send the test of disagreements, because if we want to solve problems, we need to continue to talk and have this dialogue. And there are certain things that where we're united. So, yes, of course, we can discuss other subjects, too, where we disagree. So when we talk a lot about each other, we also need to find ways to talk to each other. And that's one of the most important elements of our cooperation. So I think that's just like an important time for us to meet now. Now, if you allow me, I'll start with the first bit. I don't think there's uh, any need to link the development of our relations uh, with uh, our uh, bilateral relations with third countries. As I said, Germany is uh, one of the key trade and economic partners with Russia. We had about 80 billion US dollars of trade turnover a couple of years ago, and it started to grow. Right now it's about 50. Hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, depend on our cooperation, both here in Russia and in Germany. Now we started to buy German goods uh, in greater volume. This is how we support German uh, jobs. And what about cooperation? What about joint ventures? It's thousands of joint ventures. That's a strong contribution to improving the lives on both sides of the border, and even in the most challenging times, we never lost our contacts. Life is moving forward, we're seeing new opportunities, and you cannot resolve uh, old problems without dialogue. That's obvious. This is why Russian-German ties have their own relationship, have their own meaning. As for the law that you meant, draft law that uh, is being debated at the State Duma, the Russian parliament, I agree with you. We need to come up with a balanced uh, response. But MPs in Russia and MPs in your country are often driven by motions. As for the law itself, the EU does have a similar law and Brussels made a statement recently and they want to intensify this legislation to protect their interests from the so-called trans-border sanctions uh, from the US. So I don't think it uh, will be strange that Russia passes a similar law, but I agree with you, it must be a balanced one. It shouldn't deliver any blow to our own economy and to our partners who've uh, been operating uh, conscientiously here in Russia. And I'm sure that that's the way it will be. And as you might have heard, uh, the parliament uh, delayed the passing of the bill and it will consult the government. And the government has just been sh shaped. Uh, Thank you very much. My name is Ilya Petrenko, RT. Hello. My question is for both leaders. Traditionally, you discussed the situation in Ukraine, and in this current state, 
is it necessary to go back to the Normandy 4 communication at the top level as soon as possible? Have you discussed today a possible date for the next meeting of the four leaders when it could happen? And also about the situation in Ukraine, Ms. Merkel, this there is a very dangerous precedent in this country, a violation of freedom of speech. Uh, head of the RIA Novosti Ukraine news agency was arrested, and I would like to communicate, uh, speaking for all Russian journalists, maybe you could use your influence over the Kiev authorities and make sure that he's released and make sure that they don't do that again. I'm talking about Kirill Vyshinsky, and Mr. Putin, maybe you can also address the uh, authorities in Kiev. Now, first uh, about the Normandy 4 format. As I said, it's an important uh, tool to resolve the situation in the southeast of Ukraine. Russia is, uh, stands ready to continue working this uh, format, we believe it's very important, and as of today there's no alternative to it. We didn't discuss a particular date where we talked about such a possibility. A top-level summit needs to be prepared, and our colleagues are working on it. We have advisors and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are working on it. As for the detainment of journalists, I agree with you. He's been charged with treason for the fact that he just performed his duties, his professional duties. It's absurd. I haven't seen anything like that for a long time. That's uh, extraordinary. Now, we discussed this and we touched upon other issues that we've been facing in Ukraine, but I won't, don't want to go deeper into it. Of course, the Normandy 4 format at the top level uh, could meet, but it has to be prepared very well so that there are results. That's why our foreign, foreign ministries already began to work on that. The uh, newly appointed uh, foreign minister of Germany and the Russian foreign minister, they're already, uh, they're already working on that. And they will also talk about the UN mission and their mandate uh, in Ukraine so that this issue could be discussed at the Security Council level. Uh, that would be something that the leaders of the con countries uh, would also discuss. But it has to be, we ha we have to have something to talk about, and we need to, there, we need progress, we need an action plan. So the situation that we have right now is not satisfactory. As far as your concerns about the journalist, of course, I will discuss this with the Ukrainian president when I meet with him, and I will uh, talk about this case. The Russian journalists are arrested here and they can't do their job, and that is also a concern for us. AP. Germany accepted over 700,000 Syrian refugees, and most of them probably want to go back to Syria. Do you have any kind of signal from your Russian partners that Russia will use its influence over Syria to make sure that the political process would be uh, resumed? And Mr. President, uh, one more question about Sergei Skripal, who has been discharged from the hospital today. Can you uh, talk what you think about what you think about it? And uh, what do you think about the investigation, which seems difficult from the dis diplomatic standpoint. It's like I said, we have discussed Syria and the situation in Syria, and we support the UN initiative to start the constitutional processes, process, and there were signals yesterday from the Astana group and from, the, from, from Sochi 
that the representative would be appointed. We need a political process. We need to start a political process, and we want to help that process. I expressed our concern over the order number 10 in Syria. If people do not claim their property within a certain time frame, they will lose it. And that's bad news for people who want to go back to Syria at some point. And we will talk more about that in more detail. And we'll ask Russia uh, to use its influence over the Syrian authorities in to ask Assad not to do that, because that would be a very serious barrier for refugees uh, if they want to go back. Now, first, uh, talking about the first part of your question, if you take the areas that have been liberated by the uh, Syrian uh, government army, we see a lot of people that are coming back, even today. Like take Eastern Ghouta, some people were transported to the Idlib province uh, thanks to our uh, uh, military police uh, efforts. And right now these people say they want to go back home. So we are seeing that thousands of people are coming back. But what we need to do, we need to depoliticize the process of delivering humanitarian aid and to restore the national economy. If the EU wants uh, refugees to go back home, they need to waive the restrictions on delivering humanitarian aid to the government-controlled areas. Now, how would people come back if everything's destroyed there? Syria doesn't have the means to restore it. They are very much limited. So if the EU wants people to go back home, it needs to help Syria to restore its economy and to provide real humanitarian aid and to depoliticize this process. It's my deep conviction. Take Raqqa. Everything's destroyed. It's in ruins. And people continue to uh, die because of mines. Uh, and there are still bodies lying there. How could people return home? So we need to together think about it. And we need to work jointly on it. Now back to the Skripal case. I got it from the media reports that he recovered, he's been released from the hospital, and so it's good. We're happy that he's out of hospital. And I've got several ideas related to it. Now, if there was a military-grade uh, nerve agent who would, was used, as the UK says, he would have died on the spot. A military-grade nerve agent is so strong that a person could die immediately within several seconds, may maybe several minutes. Luckily, he's recovered. He's out of the hospital. And I hope he will be alive and well. As for the investigation, We've uh, proposed it several times to our UK counterparts uh, to assist them, and we ask them to take us on board, but there have been no response, but our proposal is still on the table. And the last question from the Russian media, thus please, Mr. Putin. You said that you discussed the unilateral uh, uh, withdrawal from the Iran nucle nuclear deal. Ms. Merkel, the secondary Iran sanctions will affect not just the Russian but also European countries. Uh, what kind of measures will you be implementing to protect your companies? And continuing with the sanctions, we know that Mr. Trump said that Nord Stream 2 contradicts the European interests and he threatens to uh, impose sanctions on companies who will be working on that project. 
Introduce sanctions, he said. Yes, introduce sanctions. And what is your prognosis for uh, this project? And the same question for Ms. Merkel as well. Europe as, uh, has its contacts with Iran, and we uh, are trying to convince Iran to honor this deal because it guarantees more control and more security. And Iran stated that it will continue to stay loyal to this agreement. We heard that from the IAEA. Maybe companies that want to invest in Iran might not be able to do that. We are discussing this in Brussels, but we shouldn't be have any illusions. We are not gonna, going to have any major compensations. These are economic decisions that the companies make, but we think that it will benefit Iran to stay in this deal because this is this deal uh, was discussed at the U UN Security Council, so it has an international foundation. So it will be good and useful for Iran to say that they will continue to honor this deal. Uh, the Nord Stream 2 project was discussed, as I said, as part of other energy projects, uh, as part of our bilateral cooperation. We have a multidimensional uh, collaboration, and again, it goes back decades, and uh, it's been very successful so far. The U.S. stance on the Nord Stream is, uh, be, has been known to us. Well, that's a rare fact, so when uh, the uh, current administration has the same position that the Obama administration had, so there's some strange continuity. We believe that there are a couple of reasons. First, uh, they support Ukraine in this way. Ukraine doesn't want to uh, develop a relationship with us, but they get the money from the transit there. It's uh, three billion US dollars. And so they want us to uh, supply money to Ukraine. Well, we're not against it. And as I said, we're ready to uh, keep the transit uh, flowing from uh, Ukraine if we see economic uh, viability. And we can see it if we had uh, talks, and we're ready for those talks. But the Nord Stream 2 projects can be used to deliver gas to Germany, but not also to Germany. But beyond that, the UK and Norway are seeing fallen production volumes, but the EU countries are seeing higher demand amid falling production. But Donald Trump is not just the U.S. president, but he's also been a uh, solid entrepreneur, a solid businessman. So he's been trying to promote the uh, interests uh, of uh, U.S. Uh, producers, uh, trying to push uh, for the sales of uh, U.S. Uh, shale gas. Is it possible? Yes. But it's uh, a 30 percent increase in prices, so it's 30 percent more expensive than Russian pipeline gas that's flowing to Ukraine. So they build uh, LNG terminals in Europe, but uh, they are over their load is only 30 uh, percent. It's economically not viable, it's not feasible, it's too expensive. But I do understand uh, the U.S. Uh, president, he protects the interests of his uh, businesses, he wants to uh, promotes U.S. made products, but it depends on us. It depends on the partners uh, in Europe. The project uh, is open for uh, any parties to join it, not only those who are uh, taking part in it right now. From what I know, there's a gas pumping station that 
is being built in Germany. We are working on our side too. We feel that it's a profitable project for us. We'll continue working on it. Thank you very much.